Well, I'll tell you what, I got my beans planted. What kind of beans? Hoss blaze, hoss blaze. Got the hoss blaze bean planted, got squash planted, got the cucumbers planted. I've replanted my cucumbers. The uh, I, I salvaged, I had a piece of a row cover, I put over and salvaged four squash plants. So, uh, tore everything else out and replanted. Got Left the four. You got your tomatoes planted? Tomatoes is planted. Tomatoes are growing like crazy. Man, they grow like you crazy. You got a plot ready for watermelons? I'm working on uh -huh. it. So close, so close, so close. <music> Welcome everyone to the Row by Row Garden Show. The best daggum gardening show on the radio and the internet as well. Glad to have you. We talking all things watermelon this evening. Mama Hoss is in the house. I'm back. Back. She's back. Short little recess here. We had Tracy last week, and this week we got Mama Hoss is back in the saddle again. Mm -hmm. I wish I back. could talk like Tracy. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah. Tracy is my wannabe. Wanna, you a Tracy wannabe? I'm Tracy wannabe. Yeah, she is a, she's a good one. Mm -hmm. I always enjoy having her here. And when she comes in, we get to spend, she drives down from Asheville, so we get to spend the day with her. So we're able to, uh, we, we go out to lunch and we, we have these in-depth industry conversations, which is always fascinating to me. And uh, she give me some, she te always tells me something I learned about. I did not, she told me this last week at lunch. She said that the indeterminate, there are four indeterminate tomatoes sold for every determinate type tomato sold in the home garden market in the United States. Four times, no, excuse me, was it 40? Yeah, it was 41. So four times as many people grow indeterminates versus determinants. And we actually, because we're a southern company, we sell more determinants than we do indeterminants. Just that kind of stuff is fascinating yeah. to me. She's just fascinating. She yeah. just well, knows information. so much. Yeah. Yeah. So if you missed that, go back to last week and watch that. I guarantee you, you'll love it. All right, so we're talking watermelons, 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 watermelons. Is that your favorite crop to grow? It's on the top of my list. Not the top top, but on the top top. The top section of my list. I've got probably three or four up there and it's at the top. I yeah. enjoy growing watermelons and therefore I enjoy eating watermelons. Yeah, so we're gonna throw up some pictures. Um, he gathers his watermelons, puts them under pecan tree. Yes, I do. And he may eat them for a morning snack, lunch, an afternoon snack. Yep. I carry a big knife on my side here in a leather sheath. And at even given time, I'm out there underneath the pecan tree yeah. and I slice me one open and I eat it. Yeah. And you Love should them. give the leftovers to the donkey and horse. They're gone to other farms. So you give them to chickens. Yep. yep. Yeah. Chickens get my leftovers. Now I'm not one, I normally grow a lot of watermelons and I have watermelons piled up there. So I'm not one to eat it all the way down to the right. No, he eats the heart and then he I eats the heart shares out the rest with and the chickens. And if I want some more, I move on. Now I have been known by myself to eat more than one watermelon in one sitting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I eat till I get till I get enough of it and then uh, therefore I move on. Mm -hmm. But he has a great treat, a great treat for me in the summertime. I don't know if anybody loves watermelons yeah. more than I do. Yeah, in the in the middle of summer, you find you in the fig trees. Yeah, fig trees. I, I grew in the this. beginning of summer, when the watermelons are in, you find you a pecan tree yeah. eating a watermelon. If I go from watermelons to figs. Yeah, yep. that's true. Yep. All right, so let's talk about some new seed varieties we've got this year. And they're watermelons. And they just so happen to be watermelons. First one here, now this isn't actually a watermelon. This is Lily Crenshaw melon which in my book it's in the it's actually a crenshaw type melon but it's more of a musk melon to me it has a very high sugar content it's a pretty early yielding musk melon so if you're into those kind of things i grew some years ago it's not something i grow every year mm -hmm. but if you're into those heck this is a good one right here it's a hybrid variety that has good disease resistance Next one here, and we're going to expand on this one more and more and more. We actually got a little picture that's going to come up. We're going to have a passing glance of this one in there. Orange Glow Watermelon. Yeah, you grew that a couple of years ago. No, it's been longer than that. It's been, uh, I did grow it a couple oh, years ago. Oh, I think ago. it was two, four, 2014, wasn't it? Mm, well, that's been, uh, it's been a while yeah. back. Yeah. First, yeah. Uh, 2014, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew this about eight years ago for the first time. Uh, 
It's a great one. I'm going to expand on it more later. It is probably the most unique colored flesh ones of all of them out there. Is that what my granddad, Papa, nope, used to grow? Nope, mm. nope, 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 nope. All right, and then we got a new one for us this year, Black Tail Mountain Watermelon. And the reason we brought this one, this is a very sweet watermelon. This is more of an icebox variety here, or type. Might I say it's a smaller type watermelon. But the reason I was so adamant about bringing this variety on is this one is the one for the northern people. Oh. Yep. Cool. This is the variety you want to grow if you're in the northern United States or you're in a higher altitude. So if you're up in the mountains uh, or if you're up north, this is your variety mm -hmm. right here. It takes... Uh, it tastes cooler weather better. Also, it's more drought resistant, some rest of them. Very sweet watermelon, smaller watermelon, but there we have Mr. Blacktail Mountain. I've never grown it, but it kind of highly recommended us as a good northern variety. And we felt like we needed to round out with a good mm -hmm. northern. So we have about 20 new seeds on our site in mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks. Yep. So if you go to hostools.com, new for 2022, you can see all our new seeds there. Yep. Yep, sure can. All right, so we're talking all things watermelons, and <sighs> watermelons is not for every gardener. Mm -hmm. I classify it as with corn. It is one of the most fulfilling things to grow in the garden. However, it's not for everybody. Not for a new gardener. I would say not. Not for an inexperienced gardener. It's a fulfilling thing to grow, but it can be challenging as well. So I would rank it up there with as far as uh, being hard to grow up there with corn. Okay, it's very nutritious. It did is very that? nutritious. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know how. I knew it was good to me. I didn't know it was good for me. Very hydrating. So yep. on a hot summer day, it's great for hydration. It's fibrous. Yeah. It has magnesium, vitamin A, C, B6. It has zero fat, zero cholesterol, and zero sodium. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Now, just a little bit of carbs. Yeah. Yep. Us diabetics have to kind of be careful there. And the big debate with watermelon, eating watermelons, is salt versus no salt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this has divided a lot of households and caused a lot of serious problems over the years right here. You got the salt camp and the non-salt camp. The team salt would be me. And the team non-salt, which would be me. I think it is absolutely, it's sinful in my book to put salt on a watermelon. I think you've got to put salt on it. However, there are some people, and we just, when we sit down to eat a watermelon, it's almost <laughs> causes serious, <laughs> man, we're getting some, don't be salting my half of the watermelon. And yeah. see, the problem is, is once we split a watermelon down the side and we, we split it up, I give her her half and I take my half. If she don't want all her half, I can't divulge on her half because it's already been salted. Yeah. So it's just... It's, it's, so the comments below, are you team salt? Which would be me. Or team non-salt? No salt. Put it in the comments below because I would love to know my... My thoughts is there is very few people out like salt on water. Mm, I disagree. Anyway, no salt. Watermelons are good for you. Now they're going to talk about four, four types. Four types of watermelons. Mm -hmm. Of course, you got the seedless. Mm -hmm. And you young people out there, you probably thought that's all there's ever been seedless. Actually, the seedless watermelons didn't kind of diverge yourself till around the 1990s. Seedless watermelons are hard to grow, but that's basically all you see. I never knew there was a seedless watermelon until we got married. There was not a seedless watermelon when we got married. Oh, it wasn't? Mm, it was in the 90s. Oh, wait. We got married a little bit before the 90s. A little bit. Yeah. A couple of years. So back when we got married, we're going to talk about the variety that was very popular when we got married. Uh, you will sometimes in the supermarket see a seeded watermelon, there, especially if it's, a, if it's a high market, watermelons are expensive. They do carry their pollinators and market those in the supermarket. You will see some seeded varieties in there. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, those are the pollinators that are used to pollinate the seedless watermelons. Now, some of the seedless watermelons that uh, come to mind are Tailgate, Harvest Moon, Summer Breeze, Triple Play, Treasure Jazz, Captivation, and Yellow Buttercup. Yellow Buttercup is that small icebox 
sealess version of the yellow dog. Okay, that's the ones we have. And if you order those, we send you a packet of sangria as the pollinators. Yeah, and there's a few left in there. Some of the first ones we packed that have a Charleston gray as the pollinator, but we're we're transitioning out all those into all sangria varieties being the pollinators. And the reason for that is the sangria has the best disease control for our seeded varieties out there. Mm -hmm. Now think about this right here, and this is where the revelation came for we transition these sangrias out there. What good is it to have, stop, let me back up here a minute. For every three plants that you plant a seedless watermelon, you gotta have a pollinator, which is a seeded variety there, in that row there for the pollination to happen. What good is it if your seeded pollinator dies and you don't have no pollinator? It doesn't make any difference how good your seedless variety is if it's not getting pollinated. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason we switched to the sangria, it being a better disease resistant and with with withstand more environmental conditions to make a good pollinator versus the Charleston growth. Moving on. Moving on. All right, the next type is the icebox, which is really popular because they're the smaller varieties here that people can put in a regular refrigerator. Mm -hmm. You know, icebox is what they used to call a refrigerator back in the day. You remember the old timers called ice box? I do. Okay. So the ice box varieties are normally are somewhere around eight to ten pounds. Most of the time they're round. I don't know that I've ever seen an ice box that was not round. How many ice boxes does it take for a serving for you? Uh I'm more of a uh I'm not an ice box kind of guy. Yeah, ice box watermelon just make me mad. <laughs> yeah, I like the bigger ones that we're gonna go over in just a minute here. I'm not I I, I can tear two or three ice boxes up. Yeah. But those are the ones that most of the people like. If there's one or two people in a family, they're small. They can manage and put them in the refrigerator. And they... Sugar baby. Sugar baby, yeah. Black see. tail, the new one. Black tail and uh, yellow dog. Yellow dog. Yellow dog is a good one. All right, the next class or types here are yellow and orange watermelons. Now, you've probably seen these before. I don't know if you ever grew them. I've got a people picture. Grow those. Yeah. We grew them a couple of years ago. Yeah, so here's a picture here. And in this picture here, you will see the orange glow. And that's one of the orange glows that I grew a few years ago. The orange glow, as the name implies, has a deep orange color to it. Now this is, I'm gonna tell you what I remember about that variety. Meat inside of it was very, very good. Very crisp, very unique flavor, very sweet. sweet. However, the rind on it was very thin. That worked fine for a home garden. But it wouldn't. You didn't handle. It didn't handle very well. So if you had to, if you're doing a market watermelon, although this one sold good at market because I gave a lady some. Miss Sherry carried some to market, and I remember her them mm -hmm. selling well for because she split one and showed everybody what it looked like. She said they sold really good. They don't do good with a lot of handling. That's the reason they never made it in a commercial market because they bruise real yeah. easy. They are such thin rind. But for a whole garden, they work fine. And of course, the yellow ones. That's the ones you probably remember your granddaddy. Yeah, from. I remember granddaddy, my papa. Yeah. Actually, growing those. Those are those bright yellow ones I grew. Baby doll last year, I'm growing one of these but years. But yellow bigger. Doll. Yeah, they come bigger too. Yeah. But these, the yellow doll and the baby doll are, are more the icebox yellows. So it can be more than one type. It can be an icebox yellow. But in general, yeah, they was big. I can remember. I've got the variety, but it was a one we used to grow that was a big, a big round one that was pale not colored. Not moon and stars. No, no, they do make a moon and stars yellow, but this was yeah. not a moon and stars. But anyway, yeah, they come in all shapes and sizes. And then the last one. This is the picnic. This is the, probably the most popular one. These are the larger watermelons. These are the ones that's 20, 25 pounds. The one that. I grew up on, and we normally classify these as the red ones, although they can yeah, be. What you like to snack on? Well, it can be bigger ones in yellow. For the most part, it is the crimson sweet, it is the uh, uh, moon and stars. It mm -hmm. is, let's see here. Georgia Jubilee. rattlesnake. Yep, Georgia rattlesnake. Charleston gray. Mm -hmm. Jubilee, crimson sweet, Congo. Congo is an old heirloom variety. Mm -hmm. My granddad used to grow Congo. Back along. He grew the Congo and the Moon of Stars. So those are the bigger ones, 85 to 90 days maturity most of the time. That's the most popular ones that you will see grown in the home garden, and the reason for that is they're easier to grow. And what do we have across from us in that field? Those would be seedless watermelons. 
I don't know what variety they are, but they're seedless watermelons. And they're grown on the plastic, and they're grown for the supermarket. So they'll come in and harvest those and come to the supermarket there. And those are the ones that you have to have the pollinator. Mm -hmm. Now, one variety that's classified in the picnic variety that is my favorite one, and I always recommend this one the most, is sangria. And we talked about sangria just a moment ago because we love to use that one as a pollinator. Let's see if we can move these over here. This is sangrias that I'm going to plant in probably about a week. I would plant them now, but we got some rain coming in. I don't have my spot exactly uh, ready yet. It's a great, great variety here. For the seed of the varieties, it has the best disease resistance. It germinates the best and it is considered an all-sweet variety, therefore it has a very high sugar content. So in my humble opinion, for the home garden, sangria, sangria. Is, is the best one to grow. The sangria is one of those bigger watermelons, so if you want a smaller one, you can, may want to tend to go to one of those ice boxes right here. So that's it right there. I tell you, when we talk about growing them in a minute, we're going to go back to this. How about that? Yeah, I'm it's trying just, to pull one out. It wasn't well, I'm going to show you how that's done. I'm having my notes back here. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so there we have that. Now let's talk about when should you plant watermelons for your zone. Now this is what I like to do. I like to transplant my watermelons. I like to grow my watermelons in trays, and I like to transplant them, although you can direct seed them. But let's talk about transplanting to start with. These watermelons right here are about four weeks old, and they're ready. They're ready to be transplanted, although they can wait another week. You can see there inside there the true the, the true leaves have come out and starting to show their separate. What size tray is this? This is 162. Now I do not recommend growing them in a 338. You need a bigger tray than that. The 162 works pretty good for these watermelons. That's the ones I grew mine in. I prefer, prefer to grow them as transplants. And the reason being is I know exactly where my plant is at, and I get a little better germination because I'm in a controlled environment. Plus weed control. I can put these out there and get a head start on my weeds. And number three is I can get a head start on the season. So if I grow these in the uh, greenhouse, I can get two to three, to maybe a four week nine, and I'm gonna back up and say two to three week jump. If you was to direct seed them at the same time that I put the transplants out there, you're looking at it probably about a, uh, a three week difference there. A lot more weeds. A lot more weeds. So I prefer me personally, to grow them in a greenhouse and move them out there. Four to five weeks, you can grow these babies out. Normally, no problem whatsoever. So, let's throw a map up there on the, uh, the screen and talk about when you could plant those. All right, seed starting dates. Now, you folks in zone 10, you would want to start, you would want to have started your watermelons around December 15th. Now, these are some general guidelines that I normally go on. You can vary off. And all this bit. is on Halsh University Watermelon Growing Guide. Yep. So if you miss it, go check out our website, Halsh University. Yep. Zone 10, December the 15th, you want to plant your seeds in the trays in the greenhouse. Zone 9, you want to plant your seeds in the greenhouse around January the 15th. Zone 8, and I pretty much stick to this date pretty hard because we're zone 8, February the 20th. Yeah. It's perfect for me every year. Zone 7 around the 15th of March. Zone 6 around the 1st of April. And Zone 5 around the 20th of April. And that's the greenhouse. That is the greenhouse. Okay. Four weeks after that, four to five weeks after that, you put them in the ground. So there's some good information there on that. Now, let's just say that you didn't have a greenhouse and you was going to grow them in the ground, direct seed them. Nothing really wrong with that. You can do that. We used to do it all the time when I was a boy mm -hmm. coming up because we didn't have uh, a place to grow transplants. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do that in ground, in ground, you want to direct seed in January, in January, in zone 10 in January, zone 9, February, 1st of March, zone 8, which we're at. Now, this can vary just a little bit. This is a good, safe bet here, April. Now, can you get by around the end of March? Yeah, especially if you're having a warm spring, you can get by. But a good old general guideline there is going to be April. You'll be safe for that. Zone 7, April to May. Zone 6 in May and Zone 5, May, June. I say toward the end of uh, May and in June for Zone 5. So Zone 7, they need to be getting ready. Yes. Yes, they're going to direct seed them. Yep, absolutely. All right, so... Grow these things in these trays can be a little 
challenging sometimes. And the reason being, these watermelons are so fragile. Mm -hmm. Now, a tomato plant is pretty tough. You just pull them right out of there. But I'm going to show you here just how fragile these things can be. Now, what I do, these are not going to pull out like a tomato plant would. But I take something like a pencil or a pen anyway, and I stick it up in the bottom right there and kind of poke it through a little bit right there. And that plant is going to pop. pop. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here if I can get it out here. I'm gonna pull it and be easy, gentle with it. So when I'm out there putting these out, I really like to be gentle with them and do them. Now you can see there that plant's pretty good. Look at the root system on that. Thing's rooted in pretty well. And that 162 tray does a wonderful job growing these so these roots don't get root back. So if you just try to pull it without it's going it's pretty much going to it's gonna damage it. Yeah. So be careful with them, pull them out there easy. And put them in there and you'll be baby fine. them baby them a little bit it's one of them jobs i do by myself because i don't trust anybody else to do well, yeah. control issue control issue yeah all right so let's talk about planting depth and the way i plant them now i always put my watermelons on drip irrigation and the reason is when you get that dense coverage and a lot of vine there which you want to grow with watermelons it's hard sometimes to water enough from the overhead to get it down to the root system also Watermelons are known to have disease issues. Now, there's not a lot of insect problems with watermelons, but the disease is a major thing. With watermelons. That's from water hitting the leaves? It's from water hitting the leaves, but it's also from uh, pathogens being in the soil where you may not have done your due diligence on crop rotation. Mm -hmm. So, soil borne diseases or leaf wetness can be a major issue. We negate some of that by using drip tape. Putting drip tape underneath there, keeping that moisture off the leaves will help a lot. Also, there's certain times when it gets hot, watermelons require a good bit of water. If you got that drip tape on there, turn that valve on and you shoot it to them. Plus, we're able, this is the main thing, we're able to shoot our fertilizer and our micronutrients through that drip tape and put it exactly at the root system there. I'm going to give you an example of that. Once those vines start running, it's hard to get in there and do anything, much less fertilize. But you can continue to fertilize once those vines start running by shooting that fertilizer through your drip tape. Using our fertilizer injector. Huge, huge game changer on growing watermelons. So use your drip irrigation, use your fertilizer injector for your fertility program or for most of your fertility program with your watermelons. Now with drip tape, you're going to read some different things out there as far as sp uh, plant spacing on watermelons. I will tell you this, if you're using drip tape, you can get more plants per thousand square feet than you can without that using overhead irrigation. I normally like to plant mine three foot, four foot, five foot, somewhere in that range. Row spacing? Row spacing. Yeah. Now, I will put my plants anywhere from one foot to two foot apart. And I know most of y'all is going to think that's crazy. But I'm going to tell you what I did last year on my watermelon crop last year. A thousand square foot was my watermelon plot. Mm -hmm. I did a video on that. I just went back and looked at my video to make sure I had my, my uh, facts right. 440 watermelons off that thousand square uh, feet. Yeah. That's a lot of watermelons, but I did a very intense plant. I planted them very close together, but I was able to do that because I could control the fertility in the water. Mm -hmm. 2.4 2.4 watermelons per plant. Wow. Is what I got off of that, which is pretty good. And they did good to the rain came. They did good to the rain came. We had a lot of rain and disease jumped on there and it caused some of us to lose some of the later ones. But that was a lot of watermelons for a thousand square feet. My point here is you if you do it right, you don't need a lot of area to make a lot of watermelons. So the emitters are 12 inches apart. Uh-huh. So how I will sometimes do it a foot apart, but I think a better strategy is doing it two foot apart. Plant space. Now you say to yourself, well, that one foot, one minute is just going to be missed. Well, not necessarily. Once those plants start running and the root system gets out, they're going to fill in and go to that other minute. So you got a pretty good air there. You went for a root zone. Mm -hmm. so, you know, go back and check that video out uh, on our water balance. And also at Hoss University, we have a fertilization schedule. Mm -hmm that tells you what to do pre-plant, two yep. weeks in, and so forth. So normally speaking, you want to pH around 6.0 to 6.5, somewhere in there. 
Uh, of course, if you got compost or you got access to chicken litter, put that out there. Anytime you can put good compost out there, it's going to benefit you. Or if you got any kind of uh, chicken litter, manure, horse manure, anything like that, boom, put it out there. And it's going to add a lot of uh, organic matter, carbon to that soil and help you. Now, on your fertilization. Mm -hmm. If I don't have any of that, I would recommend you using our complete organic fertilizer, which is pelletized hen manure. Just put this in the row. So don't spread this out everywhere. Just mix it in where your row is going to be. Pre-plant about a week ahead of time. And then when you plant, you want to get on this fertilizer schedule right here. And we're going to pop this up. Can we pop this up? Mm -hmm, we're going to pop this right up here. And there again, it's on our Hoss University site. And it gives you a strategy of injecting the 20-20-20, which is a great balanced fertilizer, microboost, which is all your minors and your secondaries. And you're going to alternate that with calcium nitrate. Mm -hmm. The reason is calcium is important to watermelons because you can also get blossom end rot on watermelons. Mm -hmm. And calcium helps make that wall of that watermelon thick and strong so it can you know, make it through all those challenging environmental issues there. So calcium nitrate alternated with your 20, 20, 20 and also microbes. Great fertilizer schedule right there. Um, and we have all that and it just lays out there what you need to do. Now for you guys that may be going to do something a little bit different here, let me see, I wrote this down. Yep. And you're going to use some granular fertilizer or whatever. Normally speaking, for the duration of the watermelon crop, you want three to four pounds of pure end of nitrogen or units of nitrogen per thousand square feet. And ideally, you want to bust that up in about three to four applications. So if you're not injecting, you can do it with a granular application. Like side dress? Side dress and something like that. You can do it with three applications. Basically, I would say one to one and a half units per thousand of nitrogen. And I would probably use, if I was doing that, I would use two ballots fertilizers and maybe one just straight calcium nitrate. Watermelons like nitrogen, however, once those melons put on about the size of a softball, if you add any nitrogen after that point, you're not really doing yourself any good. You can cause that melon to blow up and rot on you, and plus the plant is not utilizing that nitrogen at that point. Sort of like onions, once they start bulbing, yes. stop it. What you're trying to do is you're trying to grow as much dense vine as you can before a lot of fruit set. And that's where you want to utilize that fertilizer. You want to hit it with that fertilizer, grow a lot of vine, a lot of foliage there to protect that watermelon. And once you start getting a decent amount of fruit, back off that fertility. Okay. Hmm. What about insects? Not a lot of insect problems. I don't, I don't, I normally, me, I normally don't ever spray for insects. Now, disease is another, another issue there. You know, if you have some problems there, you can go to our website. We can list some things, some common problems on our host university. You can go there and see, but just personally speaking, I don't have a lot. Downy mildew can be a big issue, and there's a lot of other diseases that can be an issue on watermelons. So I normally, if I can, I try to plant on new ground. I'm planting on what we call new ground this year. I don't plant watermelons back in the same place. For, I'm on a four-year rotation with that. And you're better off to go on a new ground. But if you have to go on a rotation, never plant watermelons back to back because of a disease issue there. Anthracnose is a bad one. Gummy stem blant, dampening off. Um, all those can cause major headaches. Leaf spots that you get on the leaves there. Our complete disease control works good as a drench there, and we have some other products. Garden Foss works good on downy mildew, anthracnose, the gummy stem blight. So we have some products out there that will help you on that. The, uh, the one we have called vegetable flower fruit and ornamental fungicide is chlorothionale. Mm -hmm. And that is a good product to put on there if you're getting a lot of rain because that'll help protect those leaves. That's actually a contact fungicide. So we have all that information on there. You can go check that out and get you a program down to protect your watermelons. But I will tell you this. Don't worry a lot about insects, but worry a lot about disease on watermelons. And if you drew, use drip irrigation... That'll also be another control there yeah. for it. So yeah. Combination of all those things will help you be more successful growing watermelons. Now let's talk about pollinators for a minute. Okay. Gotta have pollinators for watermelons. You can't think you got pollinators. You got not to have pollinators. We bring bees in and put them on there. So if you are not certain that you got pollinators, you're gonna need to bring them in because you gotta have them to make. Those blooms have pollen in them that takes the bees to work them. 
to make that fruit set. So just make sure you're aware of that. Move on to harvesting. Harvesting. How do you know when they're ready? You know when they're ready, and we have a couple of videos out there about that, about yeah. two A couple pictures we're going to throw up yep. here. One of them is what we call the curly cue. And this curly cue right here, when it dries down, that's a good indication. However, your first watermelons to get start to get ready, this may throw you off a little bit. Because you may have a dried up curly cue and your watermelon may be just a tad bit on the green side. Yeah. So once you, those first ones starts coming off, that's a good system to go on that. But those first ones can throw you a little bit. Another one is that nice creamy colored bottom where it lays on the ground. So turn that watermelon. If you got that nice cream bottom there, that's another indication that you got a right watermelon. Those two things together will help you make a decision on your first ones. After that, I can watch the curly cue and make those decisions. So if you're not growing them and you buy them in the grocery store. Wow. How do you know they're ready? Well, I would look for that creamy bottom on the bottom side there. Okay. Because you can't look at the curly cube because the curly is not there. So I would turn it upside down and make sure I got the creamy bottom. Another way too, a lot of people might not know this, if it's got a little what we call sun blister part mm -hmm. on the top, a little yellow spot. Most people would discard that one, would not want that one. That's also a good indication that's a good right, right watermelon. So we were in Florida last year. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> and somebody who did not know who we were asked Greg if he could tell her. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll expand on this a little bit. So we was in Florida at this large grocery store this Saturday afternoon. We was on a fishing trip. And I was fondling the produce as I normally do. Yeah. I love to look at the produce, see where it comes from, see how much it is. But I just get mesmerized in the produce section looking at all that. And I was adoring these watermelons. And this lady turns to me and she says, can you tell me when the watermelon is right? Can you tell me when the watermelon I thought myself, I said, this lady has recognized me. <laughs> and she had not. I said, so uh, I got me a good breath of air. And I went into sermon mode. And I let, for about 10 minutes, boy, I was preaching into this lady just how you could tell everything about watermelons and all that. And I went for another breath of air, and then I realized I was giving this woman way more than what she, she just asked for. wanted to she know. She just wanted to know which watermelon to get. But I had laid it all right there to her. Man, I had preached to her. I mean, I laid it to her. And uh, <laughs> I seen on her face that I was giving her more than what she wanted. So I backed off from that and uh, couldn't find out she had not a clue who we were, but uh, I, I thought she probably did. And uh, I helped her pick out a watermelon, and we went on there. But. Uh, I thought that was interesting. You can get kind of windy. I can get kind of windy when I'm passionate about it. So yeah, don't ever was, ask Hoss how to pick out a water. I was passionate about that. Yeah. And I said, this lady here wants to know it. And I have a... No, she have, didn't. She just wanted to know you show her I which one. I thought I had about. somebody there that wanted to hear what I needed no. to say. No, they didn't. Anyway, we worked it out. I'm sure that night she had a conversation with her husband about it. You won't believe what happened. This crazy this man. This crazy man went in the on for store. 10 minutes talking about watermelon. Yeah. Okay, so something interesting that I read mm -hmm. is to look for the brown spots on the watermelon. Now, I've never heard of that. It's called webbing. I know what the webbing is, but I've never heard of looking at the brown spots. It says what? for every brown spot that you see, that's how many times a bee has touched the pollinating parts of the watermelon. I, I would have to have somebody that I respected their opinion tell me that was correct. That's the first time in my life I've ever heard that. Now let me let me let you say I don't consider myself a watermelon expert. I'm a watermelon whisperer. Oh, you so I him. do know I think I know a little bit about watermelons but I've never heard of that before. I'm not saying it's not true but I've never heard So of what that. do you whisper to the watermelons? I whisper to them I said are you right? And then they <laughs> whisper right yes or no and I miss it every time then. Uh, yeah. They talk back to they you? They talk back to me sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So stored watermelons, you normally, st I store my watermelons underneath that big pecan tree. Mm -hmm. Put them out of direct sunlight and they'll stay for a couple of weeks there. Family comes by and gets some. Neighbors, Neighbors comes by yeah. and gets some. They know we've got watermelons that's ready there underneath the tree. Just come by and help yourself. Yeah. We have a steady stream of yep. people coming by and picking up watermelons. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we do. We enjoy growing watermelons. We enjoy giving them away. And most of all, we enjoy eating them. You do. Yeah. Yeah. So this week, did we have the old goat here? We do. It's somewhere here. Somewhere here? Yeah. We need to draw. Slide that out. 
Tracy kind of gave it away last week, but yeah. we're, we still. We're back on the old goat. If you find the old goat and Tony found it last week, right? Yeah. Tony found it last week. So Tony, what's his last name? Gender? Gen Gen Gendler? Gendler? Gendler. Tony, send us your uh, shipping information address to cussserve at hostools.com. We'll send you a coveted host souvenir for picking out the old goat. So uh, the Oki Homestead's over here. Yeah. Said no, and I talked to Jason the other morning. He said it was a wonderful, wonderful show. We weren't able to make it, but he just went on and on about what a wonderful show it was. So glad they had a good time there. Yeah, I hate yeah. we missed it. Yeah, I Maybe too. next year. Yep. All right, what else we got going on? Petals, petals of the past. Of the past. Um, Antiques in the Garden, meet and greet, Saturday, April 23rd, 9 to 5. There'll be a link below. It's free, but if you'll register, we'll know how many people's going to be there. Look forward to seeing you there. Actually, Petals from the Past, if you go to their website, you can Google Petals to the Past and they have a little, you go to events and they actually have a, a page talking about this mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. So, this year they're adding the YouTubers meeting group. And Petals from the Past, you may not know, is a big garden center over in Alabama that are known known throughout Alabama as being one of the best garden centers, period. They do fruit trees and lot roses. Of fruit trees, yeah. And roses. Yeah, very knowledgeable. Everybody I've talked to just raves and raves about Jason and his family that run the uh, Pebbles from the Past. Mm -hmm. yep. So we're looking forward to that. We'll be there that Saturday. All right, folks, what if we inspired you to grow watermelons? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And maybe we give you some insight on how to do that. So did you consider underneath that tray, shade tree? And eat the heart out of that one. Yep, just get it all over. If you have any comments, put them below. If we miss something, you have a question, and be sure to subscribe, like, yep. ring that bell so you get notified every time we have a new video. Yep, absolutely. All right, folks, now it's time for you to get out there and get dirty.